Hello, my name is Michael Maltz and I'm an architect. Uh, in 2012, we received the commission to design the new Inuit Art Center that will be a part of the Winnipeg Art Gallery, connecting the outstanding late modernist building by Gusta Rosa and simultaneously have its own identity adjacent to the WAG. When people hear about an architect from Los Angeles designing a building representing the ideas, art, and culture of people from the Arctic Circle, there are inevitably questions. I think that's reasonable, and the questions aren't that dissimilar to the ones architects ask themselves beginning a design project in a place that's different from where they're from. What are the appropriate influences I can respond and connect to? How do I begin to understand the context and the place and the culture? And what relation to that context can you create that are meaningful? Now, the term context gets used a great deal in architecture. How to respond to your physical setting is one of the first lessons you learn in architecture school. And having the tools that allow you to relate to the city around you is a good thing. It gives you a right way to do things, and if an architect says they're relating to the surrounding context, people generally nod their heads in affirmation as if they're hearing a kind of canonical truth. But I come from a, what many people call a contextless city. That's generally not offered as a compliment as if we're all living somehow a kind of diminished or less ennobled life. The reality is I don't think most people in Los Angeles actually miss context or even know that it hasn't arrived in town yet. Perhaps it's that the city is relatively new, or perhaps it's just that the city is so vast. In any case, the idea of context doesn't help one get to the essentials of the place, getting to what is real, shared, and authentic about the city. Realizing this caused me to look less at context and more to the appearance of characteristics as a way to comprehend what I was experiencing. That might seem like a semantic difference, but I don't think it is. It points to a more maybe sometimes ineffable quality of that metropolis to that place, to the ambient, nuanced, lasting characteristics that are arguably even more deeply rooted in the mix of physical and cultural presences there. I think that sensibility and approach can be useful when thinking about how to understand and represent such an architecturally untraditional place like the North. Two quotes from the initial brief for the IAC were on my mind as we approached how to begin the design. The first spoke to the civic and urban design ambitions of the new center. The gallery's holdings of contemporary Inuit art had grown to be a major collection, and the gallery's commitment to the North had developed into a prime focus. The potential of this new center was seen as an opportunity to create a stronger engagement to an even broader community for the gallery. This part of the brief was clear. Dealing with civic relationships in a city are things that are familiar responsibilities in architecture and for architects. And setting up the right choreography through and around the building and getting the right visual connections between inside and out were, in a sense, normal work. I knew, though, that there would be one part of the brief that would raise my architect's anxiety. There always is. And then I saw this quote that spoke about the ambition to portray the true culture, history, and stories in place of the Inuit. That's complex. How could architecture portray the phenomenal qualities of Northness without resorting to installing a snow display? In other words, how do you make something authentic and not... not reduce it to a gimmick or a cliché. To that first part of the brief, we started by looking at what relationship was right to make to the De Rosa building. We looked at many different shape ideas and three-dimensional model, trying to capture the spirit of the new center and of Gus's building. But it was after our transformational trip to the north that we came to a form that I like to describe as an object that completes another object as if the two unique, distinct sculptural forms are also inseparable at the same time. We also proposed a ground floor that would link the traditional front door of the WAG with the new IAC and eventually through to Colony Street. This will have the effect eventually for the WAG and the IAC of stretching out to open in all directions to the city, creating a type of cultural hub at the heart of the gallery. Returning to the second idea of the brief, how to portray the work and culture of the Inuit, I thought we had to start with how to show the work itself. Stephen and I visited many museums and galleries in North America and Europe, hoping to find useful models. 
either in their cultural implications or in their physical similarities of the types of objects that would be exhibited. But we came away from all of those trips feeling like most of the displays were just that, displays. They all tended to objectify the art, felt lifeless, overly precious, historical, and even worse, anthropological. But the Inuit collection is a contemporary collection, one that's alive, thriving, and importantly, still growing. One way we are trying to change the traditional model is to take the vast collection itself, which in most galleries is hidden away in storage, and make it the whole ground floor of the new center. This will place the formerly closed collection right at the highly visible corner of Memorial and St. Mary. It is literally a transparent, approachable entry to the center that makes the collection the first thing that one sees entering the IAC, the WAG, and also, importantly, by those just passing by on foot or by car. Secondly, we wanted to make the act of creating to be a real part of the visitor's experience. To accomplish this, we've positioned the WAG Studio Art Education Program as the middle layer in the sandwich of the building, so that as you move up or down from the collection lobby to the gallery, you move through adults, children, artists, literally making work, providing the rare experience in galleries of being connected to the act of creation, not just the result. Maybe even relating to how visible the making of art is in the North. And then there's the question of how to exhibit the work itself. Really, since the beginning of the display of art began, especially in institutions, there's been an argument that art looks the best, feels the most alive in a space that's similar to the studio space in which the artist created it. That's true of much of art. The fact that artists' loft-like studio spaces became a model for many contemporary galleries is just one example of that phenomenon. For Inuit art, the studio has been the north itself in its vastness, scale, and light. It's a fascinating juxtaposition, that scale of the studio and the fact that the pieces, especially the carvings, are often so physically small in relationship to that enormous studio. The typical exhibition response to that has been to make intimate vitrines and cases to bring the scale down to the size of these pieces but somehow that often seems to diminish them. Instead, we've chosen to make an exhibition space that which, while not at the full scale of the North, perhaps begins to insinuate it. The ambition is to create a type of space where the characteristics of light, scale, undulating form, topography, and vastness are in a dynamic dialogue with the power of these exquisite objects. It's a strategy that counts on the belief that the extraordinary intensity beauty, and spirit of the culture and art of the North can not only hold itself within the abstraction and awe of its own landscape, but that quality in this new setting can travel and thrive as a real bridge between ideas, traditions, ambitions, linking cultures, as the best of art always does. Thank you. <laughs>